That's what you have to say. See the crew back there? That's in my mouth. Turn around. Our little
Good morning. We welcome you to worship this morning, whether you're here in person or online. We pray that this time of worship is a blessing to you. Our combined summer worship continues through September 3rd. We will have fellowship hour today after worship in the fellowship hall. Our lectern flowers today are given by Sis DeMarco to the glory of God and in memory of her mother, Mary Campbell. Our nursery is closed during the summer, but kids are always welcome in worship. The North and Franklin doors are locked, and as are the offices during worship now. And if you're coming in to the Franklin Street door, you can now only come in with your key on the left side, just FYI. VBS is tomorrow, and so we're super excited about that. If you want to help see Chris Sholkoff, our memorial walkway, you can still honor someone with a brick there. You can find those forms in the narthex. You can join church friends for a Blue Claws baseball game. See Dave Smith. I will be out of the office starting tomorrow through July 30th. Pastors Karen Brostrom, Annie Pantoja will be preaching. Pastoral coverage will be available. Just call the church office. Now let's bless our VBS leaders. If you are helping or leading or teaching at VBS, would you please come down? of them this week because they will be busy every morning this week of VBS. Friends, you can also check our website and Facebook for more news and events. Now let us prepare our hearts to meet God in this time and place of worship. Let us worship God. Please stand for the call to worship. Jesus Christ has set us free. We are free from the bondage of sin. We are free to begin again. We are free to love, free to serve. Free to celebrate the good news. Uh, a lot of them came 
Now that in fact Do Lord, our second tune, is in fact one of those. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's uh, let's have some fun with this, okay? All right, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> all morning. <laughs> Friends, please join in our unison prayer of confession. Loving and gracious God, we come before you humbly to confess our sins. You know how we have hurt one another, where we have failed to help, when we have been too quick to speak and too slow to listen. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Show us how to love one another and to forgive as we have been forgiven. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please take a moment for silent confession. Hear the assurance of forgiveness. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus Christ came to set us free. By his grace, we have been forgiven. Amen.
Holy God, may your word be a light for our lives. Open our hearts to the power of your word and your way. Amen. The gospel lesson today comes from Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Yes, Father. For such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except for the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord.
everybody can stand, if you're able to, please do. Thank you, guys. Our epistle today is from Romans 7, verses 15 to 25a. Hear this word of the Lord for you today. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us. Open our hearts and minds. Be with us, we pray. Amen. So some people say it's the most challenging word that we have, and it's only two letters. Just guess. It's a tiny word. With awesome power and consequence, it's the word no. I mean, who wants to hear no? No, you can't do that. No, you don't need that. No, you can't have that. 
No, that's not good for you. No, that's the wrong choice. No, 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 no. The problem is we do want that. We do want to say that. We do want to do that. We do want to have that. And we do make wrong choices all the time, right? When my niece Audrey was little, she stood in front of an outlet saying, no, just like she'd heard a million times before from her parents. And then you know what she did. She reached out and stuck her finger in the outlet. That's us. It's hard to hear no in a world of yes, isn't it? I mean, we hear all day long from the world just how much we need certain things. I mean, you deserve this. You need this. You should choose this, and you should get this right now. Call in the next 15 minutes, and you'll receive this for just two low payments of $19.99. The first 10 callers are the only ones who will receive the discount. The sale is only good through today. You go to ShopRite, and where is, where's the candy and the gum? I mean, it's in the checkout lane. All because we want to say yes when we should say no. We know that we want what we want when we want it, and we usually want it right now. No is difficult in a world of yes. In a world where all of our kids are told that they need the latest, greatest toys right now. In a world where all of the adults are told we need the latest, greatest toys right now. The latest computers and phones and gadgets and homes and cars and clothes. Saying no is hard in a world that encourages us to just say yes. Now maybe the hardest circumstances with our money. I mean a lot of people don't even carry cash anymore. Most people use plastic for almost anything which means it's really easy, right? Oh, it just swipes. Or it's on your phone. You just hold up your phone. Buy now, pay later, much, much more, much, much later. We all have a hard time saying no in this society. No is hard to hear, hard to say, hard to act on. It is a powerful little word with just two letters. But why is it so hard? And why is it so hard for us as followers of Jesus Christ? Paul says in Romans 7, I do not do the good I want. The evil I do not want is what I do. Anyone relate to that? Remember the cartoon characters Tom and Jerry? Tom with that little devil and angel on his shoulder, and he gives in to the little devil ideas? Reformed theology, of which Presbyterianism is a part, acknowledges this sinful nature. In other words, we know that we're going to say yes when we should say no. Some people have called this depravity, which sounds really awful and serious, because it is. Our situation is not good, which is exactly why we need Jesus Christ, and it's why the good news is so good, because on our own, we can try to do good, but we default to the bad so much of the time, which puts our lives in this bad place, unless... Unless we turn to our Savior, Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from our sins and give us freedom. Freedom from all of our failures. In fact, we are given a clean slate every time. What could be better than that? The problem is we don't always think we need Jesus. Sometimes we think we just need to know the rules. And, I mean, you can open up our holy book, turn to the law, and see that God has given us things like the Ten Commandments. And Jesus has given us the greatest commandment. But the law is like this double-edged sword. Its purpose is to bring life. God created the rules to keep us safe, help us live life fully. It's to our benefit to follow God's law, right? But can that law save us? Paul says we can't rely on that because we have the angel and the devil on our shoulder. And the little devil has such great ideas and enticing suggestions. 
and we think, what's the harm? What's the harm in doing a little bit of that? Anybody ever read The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Ooh, it's perhaps the greatest work about this struggle. It's the devil writing to his little nephew, the junior devil, about how to turn Christians away from God. Boy, can you find yourself in those pages. It's funny and convicting. We all have this struggle. The good we want is not what we do. We do the evil we don't want to do. It's just our human condition. Frederick Beekner, one of my favorite Presbyterian theologians, once said, if there is a terror about darkness because we cannot see, there is also a terror about the light because we can see. There's a terror about light because much of what we see in the light about ourselves and our world, we would rather not see. We would rather it not be seen. God's law can lead to life, but it can also lead to, lead to death because we can't seem to obey it on our own. And when we look in the mirror and we're exposed to the light, what we see is often not very pretty. I read about an experiment conducted by researcher Robert Kidalny at the Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. The park had a big problem. So they wrote it across a big warning sign that said, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft. Losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year mostly a small piece at a time. Now the sign was supposed to appeal to our moral compass, but this researcher wanted to know if that's what really happened. So he put little loose pieces of petrified wood along many of the trails, and on some of the trails posted a big warning sign to not steal and other trails had no signs at all. <laughs> Can you guess what happened? The trails that had the written warning signs had three times more theft than the trails without the signs. Kidalny was curious about whether the law, the signs, had two effects. One would be, wow, I should be careful, they're losing so much of this precious wood. But the other effect might be, wow, this petrified wood is going fast. I better get mine today. Or 14 tons a year? Surely it won't matter if I take a few pieces. God's law designed to give us life but sometimes it leads us to do what we know we shouldn't do, kind of like the old adage, rules are made to be broken. So what can we do? As Paul's letters ask, are we supposed to just abandon God's law? Well, no, the law has this important role. It can lead to a better life, but it also reveals our need for God's grace. It reveals how much we need God's help, how we need Jesus to just make it through life. And we realize we don't need just a little bit of faith or just a touch of Jesus' way of life. We can't do life without Jesus. But I read a commentary this week saying that many of us treat Jesus like protein powder in a smoothie. You know, he's just a little moral boost for our lives. Something we need a little touch of, especially on Sunday. But that's not true. Jesus is our life, and we need him desperately. It reminds me of the 12 steps. The first step being admit you're powerless over your addiction. Your life has become unmanageable, which leads to step two. Believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity, which leads to step three. Make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to God. Paul could have written some of those steps. We're supposed to realize what bad shape we're in and how much we need Jesus. 
to restore us to sanity, to take over our lives and our will. And thankfully, that's exactly what Jesus came to do, and Paul sums it up. In Romans 5, 8, he says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news. But we still treat our lives kind of like a bank account. As long as we make more good decisions than bad ones, more deposits than withdrawals, we're okay. But is that really all God wants for us? Is our salvation dependent upon just making more good choices? I sure hope not. Because that's works salvation. That's trying to earn our way to God, which is the opposite of the gospel. We do good works out of gratitude for what God has given us. Good works are not our scorecard to get to heaven. The truth is we don't have to rely on our own good choices. And we don't have to earn our way to heaven. And we don't have to pretend we are good. We can strive for the best, but know that when we fail, we receive God's amazing grace. And if we go to Jesus asking for help, he can work through us. But we have to go to him for help. Lately in the news, there's been lots of riptide warnings about the Jersey Shore. So I was reading a story about John R. Orberg telling about his friends, Jimmy and Davey, who were in the ocean in Mexico when a riptide swept them both out to sea. And they were too far away from the shore for their screams to be heard. And so Jimmy, a strong swimmer, knew he couldn't do this, and he thought, my family's going to have to have a double funeral. That's when a cousin saw what was happening, ran out to the sandbar, and he knew that they couldn't swim against it, but they could swim parallel to the shore. He yells at them to do that, and eventually they make it to the sandbar, get pulled out, all because the cousin was saying, it's okay, come to me. What if that's what God is doing in our lives? Saying, it's okay, come to me. Quit fighting against that riptide of sin. What if that's what Jesus was saying in our gospel today in Matthew 11? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I love those verses. I love them because they speak to me when I am stressed out, but also when I make bad choices. Because in both cases, there's a heavy burden. And Jesus is the one who offers rest. That's the choice before us. We can try to make it on our own goodness and fight against that riptide of sin, or we can realize that God is reaching out to us saying, come to me, I will give you rest. I will live in you. It's all about God at work in us. It's about having our hearts and lives taken over by Jesus. That's our hope. The late South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that his favorite verse was Romans 5, 8, because it sums up the gospel. And he said, you know, we think we have to impress God so that God will love us. But God says, you're loved already, even at your worst. Tutu said his outlook on life is based on hope, not optimism, but hope. He said, I'm not optimistic. I'm different. I'm hopeful. I'm a prisoner of hope. In the world, you have some very bad people, and they look like they're going to win. But all of them eventually bite the dust. The truth is, evil does not ultimately win. It looks that way sometimes, this side of heaven. And all throughout the Bible, especially in the Psalms, people lament this. They lament the seeming good fortune of bad people. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, death and sin do not win. What wins is God's grace, God's love. God's mercy, 
We are victorious over that little devil sitting on our shoulders. So how can we learn to say no when we want to say yes? How can we help one another say no in a world of yes? What if the answer is found in a very old story that you've probably heard before, whose author is unknown? A grandfather was talking to his grandson. Grandson, he said, there are two wolves living in my heart, and they are at war with each other. One is vicious and cruel. The other is wise and kind. Grandfather, said the alarmed grandson, which one will win? The grandfather paused and said, the one I feed. Which one will we feed? Will we feed the good side with the words and life of Jesus Christ? Because that is our good news of the gospel. And for that, all God's people can say together, Amen. May be seated. We now come to our time of worship when we share the joys and burdens upon our hearts. We lift them up to God together in prayer, and our response to each is, Lord, hear our prayers. What joys and concerns do we bring to God today? 
Yes, Ron. Seizures and vision issues. Breathing. Thank you. Gracious God, we lift up Ron's friends to you, Lord. They need your healing power. The one who is suffering with seizures and the other one with breathing issues. Lord, just put your healing hand upon each one of them. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Mickey. Lord, we pray for Mickey's sister, Kathy, who also needs your healing power. Lord, restore her to health and surround her with your love. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Ellen. Lord, we pray for Eileen and her mom who is in hospice care. Lord, we know that she is about to meet you, and we ask that you would just bring your peace beyond all understanding. Lord, hear our prayers. Chris. Lord, we pray for Eric, who is back in the hospital for chemo. We ask, Lord, that you would bring him your strength and your power and your healing. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Evie. For the new hamster. All right. Gracious God, we give you thanks for Evie's new hamster. Thank you for this new little life, and we ask that you would help her to care for it and love it. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Janet. Lord, we give you thanks for Brian and Belen celebrating their second anniversary. We thank you, Lord, for their love and their marriage. Please be especially with Kristen and Diane and surround them with your healing power, your strength, and your love. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Roland. Very good. Gracious God, we thank you for Roland and his granddaughter and her husband being here. And we pray that you would just surround them with your traveling mercies as they go on to visit more family. Lord, hear our prayers. Other joys or concerns that we have? Dave? Lord, we pray for those tenants who are unable to afford their rent. We ask, Lord, that you would help them to find the help that they need and the support that they need. Lord, hear our prayers. Other joys or concerns that we have today? Are there any online? Lord, we pray for Diana's sister, Elaine, who is fighting cancer. Give her your strength and healing, and be also with her mother, who is recovering after surgery. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. 
Lord, we pray for Mirvat's aunt who fell out of her bed and broke bones. We ask that you would just bring your healing to her. Lord, hear our prayers. Any other joys or concerns? Friends, let's continue in prayer. Gracious God, today we also lift up to you June Nakora, and we ask that you would continue to heal her elbow. Be with Renee Desper, Ralph Evans, Eleanor Gadosik, Vicki Haddad, John Hartley, Lynn Molesky, Roland Montserrat, and John Murphy. Lord, hear our prayers. Be with all of those that are homebound or in a nursing home. We especially remember Sarah Day, Bob McGrory, Faye Steinhauser, Faye Thomas, and Ron Wolf. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for our members and friends serving in the military and their families. Lord, hear our prayers. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, we are invited to come to you with all of our burdens and concerns. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for the world around us. Our national news is filled with stories of violence and harm. We live in a world where many are in danger. Change our moral consciousness, Lord, to one in which safety and preservation of life is our most important concern. May we each look deep into your word, Lord, to find the way to live. We pray for the sick and suffering people in our world and our community. We pray for your grace to be found. Even when people face that diagnosis or medical news, may your love just saturate the grief that that news brings. For those who suffer from pain and discomfort, we pray that you will ease their suffering and give them your hope. Lord, we ask that you would look upon our relationships, our families, and strengthen them, build up our marriages, reinforce our friendships, Bless the ties that bind us. Enable us to be the parents, grandparents, sons and daughters you have called us to be. And bless our families. We ask that you guide this church into new life and health. Teach us each to live in such a way that the power of God working in us is evident. May all that we do as a church and all that we do as individuals glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name and join our voices in the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we can never thank God enough for our many blessings. Let us bring our time, talent, and treasure to God with hearts of joy and gratitude. Thank you. 
May the living God be with you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, before you to show you the way, and in your heart to give you 